At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And here I am, back again for episode number eight, As Are You. Thank you so much for coming back. If this is your first time checking out the Cannabis Podcast, welcome. I hope you enjoy the experience. Today, we are taking a look back because it has been, as of yesterday, or midnight today, I suppose, exactly three months since legalization of cannabis in Canada. What do you think has been accomplished in the last three months? A different type of quarter, I suppose. A quarter of the year has passed since legalization on October 17th. And today, we'll take a little look back at what exactly has been accomplished in those three months, primarily on the retail side of things, and especially in BC, what has been accomplished along that path. Also, I want to express my thanks to those of you who are writing me to give you your thoughts on the podcast, and I'm thankful for your interest and your desire to help me continually improve what we're covering here. In fact, it was a listener who sent in, and it was a listener who found me through the Canadian subgroup on Reddit, and he sent in one of the links we're going to talk about today. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. And that is on vaporizer temperatures and those wonderful little terpenes and when they get released. That's one of the things we're talking about today. And speaking of terpenes, we're going to dive again a little deeper into some explanation, this time on pinene, which is another prevalent terpene in cannabis, especially in sativas or sativa-dominant hybrids, because pinene is an energy terpene. Thanks to HelloMD.com for those details. We'll cover a little bit later. I'm also going to touch on another article that I came across that hit kind of close to home, actually. What do you do when you find a seed in your cannabis? The way things are now, can you grow it? Who knows? We'll explore that a little bit later. That's a story from Leafly.com. And another one that piqued our interest this week, I suppose because I'm kind of in this demographic, why are so many seniors jumping into the cannabis pipe? It's one of the reasons why, in fact, I started this podcast is because I wanted to supply that audience with some information that they may not have. There's a story on Guardian.com we're going to look at about seniors jumping into the cannabis fray. That's the layout this week on Episode 8 of the Cannabis Podcast. One of the things that I am really excited about is hearing from more of you about what you think about the podcast and what we might want to change as we look towards doing things a little different in the future. And one of the people that contacted me this week is also an example of what we've talked about before. Back in episode two, David Wiley from MokanaganZ.com talked about his experience where he was a high school user and then he left it for a few years and came back to it. Well, Stephen, who contacted me this week, is another perfect example of that. He's 55 years old, has not had a toke for 25 years. Legalization came along. He's back into it. He's a listener to the podcast, and in fact, it is Stephen who sent me this link. It is from honestmarijuana.com, and its whole discussion point is the temperature of how temperatures affect cannabinoids. So this is an article from honestmarijuana.com. When you light a match or flick your bic, the flame produces at a minimum 600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. So hot, in fact, that it's actually destroying a portion of the cannabinoids in your pot, which is bad. A normal flame can do so much damage because most cannabinoids begin to boil at half or even a third of that 600 degree Fahrenheit. Why is that such a bummer? Well, think of it this way. Let's say you want to make a box of the tastiest mac and cheese on the planet. The first step is to boil some water. So you put a pan on the stove and turn on the burner. But let's say you get distracted because you've been vaping a little bit and you forget all about the pot of water. What happens? The water eventually boils away leaving you with no mac and cheese in a seriously scorched pan. Well, the same thing happens when you immolate your weed. 
the high heat of the flame basically boils off a good portion of the cannabinoids. And after that, you're left with less of the good stuff you came for and some seriously scorched smoke. That's where you get that really harsh feeling and you start coughing. Temperature and flavor. Though cannabinoids get all the press, marijuana also contains other vital chemical compounds called terpenes. We, of course, have spoken much about terpenes here on the Cannabis Podcast. These molecules are largely responsible for the flavor of your ganja, but they can also have some unique physical effects as well. The thing is, terpenes and flavonoids also boil away at much lower temperatures than that 600 degree Fahrenheit produced by an open flame. So not only are you losing out on some of the medicinal or psychedelic components of your cannabis, but you're also losing out on some of the flavor. Now, there are a lot more details in this article, and if you want to read the whole thing, I do have the link back on the website connected to the episode. But what I want to concentrate on the rest of for this episode is later on in the article, right near the end, where they talk about the general guidelines for vaping and how to adjust temperatures for special effects, because I think that's the part of this article that really impacts you and I the most and where it can have perhaps the most impact. So they're suggesting for the best mind trip, a truly consciousness expanding mind trip, you want to get as much THC, CBD, myrcene, libanine, and beta caryophyllene as possible. They suggest to do this, set your vape gear to 360 degrees Fahrenheit. And because I am in cannabis, I will convert That's 179 degrees. Because I am in cannabis, did I just say because I am in cannabis? I think I did. What I meant to say was because I am in Canada, I will convert to Celsius. 360 degrees Fahrenheit is 179 Celsius. Well, in fact, that's actually wrong. I I don't know where I got 179 from. 360 degrees Fahrenheit is 182 Celsius. So because I am in Canada, not cannabis. I will convert those for you. Let's look at best flavor. If you're looking to do best flavor, here are the recommendations for your vaping degrees. They're suggesting 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 176 Celsius. That will provide a full and intense blast of flavor without the harsh, hack-inducing sting that often comes at higher temperatures. And I'm sure we can all relate to that. Looking at best energetic with a clear high, That's where we want to bring a little more CBD into the picture, assuming there is some in the cannabis you were smoking. So if you're looking for an energetic, clear high, what you're searching for will need a vape setting of about 356 Fahrenheit, or there's that 179 that I talked about before. 356 Fahrenheit is a 179 Celsius. That ensures you get as much CBD in your vapor as possible, and the CBD works to counteract the negative side effects of THC, So hopefully you won't feel anxious, paranoid, heavy, or any of those other nasty side effects. If you just want to get stoned and make as deep an impression on the coach as possible, they suggest setting your vaporizer to 392 Fahrenheit. That's your best body high. 392 Fahrenheit comes out at 200 degrees Celsius. may seem a little counterproductive, but this temperature apparently maximizes the entourage effect to provide a truly righteous high. And now we are talking serious temperatures when we talk about best medication. If you're looking for CBD, CBN, and CBC, which play a vital role in the use of marijuana as medication, the terpenes linalool and humulene also have some essential medicinal effects that should not be discounted. Now, to get the best medication from your Mary Jane, you want to go as high as possible without actually burning your bud. Now, here they talk about setting your vape gear at 430 degrees Fahrenheit, I was not able to do that. I use a Mighty, and as high as it will go is 410 Fahrenheit, which is 210 Celsius. So that's as high as I can go on the Mighty. They're suggesting 430. And the reason they're suggesting as high as you can go, but stay away from the combustion temperature, which is 451 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in their wrap-up paragraph, they say, if you had to choose one temperature is the ideal for vaping, and I think this is one that I would disagree with them on, they would go with 410 Fahrenheit or 210 Celsius. That is ridiculously high compared to all of the cannabis that I have smoked in the 179 to 184 range. Uh, 210 is incredibly high, and I, I gave it a try before starting this particular episode. Then I coughed an awful lot, 
because the cannabis gets very, very harsh very, very quickly at 210. Now, I suppose if you do that and you have an adequate supply and you're only doing like one hit out of every one, then it might be all right. But that's their recommendation anyways. I thought some very interesting information there from honestmarijuana.com. Thank you to Stephen for pointing it out to me. And you can check out the link in the links with the podcast if you want to check it out any further for yourself. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12-15 to 15 to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lift Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lift & Co Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Now what I wanted to look at was a story that caught my eye from theguardian.com this last week. Now, it is a story that applies to the States, but I think a lot of it has probably crossed over here into Canada. And certainly since we have legalized cannabis across the country, I wouldn't be surprised that a similar story would find similar things in Canada. And that is, the question is, the mature stoner, why are so many seniors smoking weed? As attitudes towards cannabis shift, the fastest growing group of users is over 50. And marijuana's popularity among seniors is beginning to change the American experience of old age, and likely the Canadian experience as well. So they ask the question, why are more seniors getting high? It might make more sense to ask, why not? As adults reach retirement, they age out of drug tests and have far more time on their hands. Some feel liberated to abandon long-held proprieties. Elegant vape pens and other attractive, discreet products have helped destigmatize the drug among older Americans. Legalization seems to make non-users seem a little less scared of it and perhaps less judgmental, says Joe, a 56-year-old cannabis user who preferred not to use her real name. Now that's something that has to change. <laughs> People have to start using their real names. The seniors using cannabis today are not your parents' grandparents. The generation that camped out at Woodstock is now in its 70s. They have been around weed long enough to realize it's not going to kill them, and are also probably more open to the possibility it will come with some health benefits. Seniors' affinity for weed is beginning to ripple across the U.S. healthcare system. A 2016 study found in states with access to medical marijuana, those using Medicare Part D, which is a benefit primarily for seniors, receive fewer prescriptions for other drugs to treat depression, anxiety, pain, and other chronic issues. For the most part, scientific research has not confirmed marijuana as an effective treatment for these conditions, but proven or not, a number of seniors evidently prefer it to the medications they would otherwise be taking. A study published last year in the Journal of the American Medical Association found opioid prescriptions for Medicare Part D recipients dropped 14% after a state legalized medical marijuana, a hopeful sign amid the opioids crisis. While some doctors have expressed concerns about seniors self-medicating with weed, virtually everyone agrees the public health consequences of opioids are far worse. And the most serious health concerns associated with marijuana, such as impaired brain development, tend to affect younger people. For the industry, seniors' newfound interest in cannabis is a business opportunity. The Colorado Edibles Company, Warner Brands, among many others, sells cannabis products reminiscent of medicines familiar to seniors. Wana sells extended-release capsules, as well as products with different ratios of THC and CBD, which intoxicate users to different degrees and can have a variety of effects on ailments. It has not escaped the pharmaceutical industry that marijuana could soon be seen as a viable replacement for many of its products, Perhaps someday soon it will be normal for seniors to pass their last decades in a cannabis-induced haze. And I would suggest here in Canada, as of October 17th this year, or last year, we have already reached that stage. (laughs) And now the other thing that I mentioned at the start of the show was a little more in-depth knowledge about a particular terpene called pinene. And for this, I want to thank the folks at HelloMD.com. Gene McKinney was the author of this particular article from Hello MD on pinene. Do you love the sweet earthy smell of pine needles on a Christmas tree? 
or the flavor boost that spices like oregano and dill can lend to your favorite foods? If you do, thank pinene, the very common terpene that gives these and many other plants their distinctive fragrance. But pinene also has potent healing properties. And that makes pinene-rich cannabis strains especially effective for treating a long list of health conditions such as asthma, arthritis, and Crohn's disease. Pinene is one of a very large group of terpenes, which are fragrant oils produced by the glands in many kinds of plants. Because of their strong smells, terpenes ward off predators. But these pungent oils also benefit the human body and brain. Terpenes are found in so many plants that are used for flavoring food that a number of them are considered food grade or safe for consumption. Though some terpenes are still considered toxic when consumed in large quantities, terpenes can also be extracted and used alone as essential oils. Pinene is abundant in the plant world, and cannabis is no exception. Research continues to reveal new information about the properties of the more than 200 terpenes found in the various strains of cannabis sativa, and numerous studies have shown that the major terpenes have considerable heating properties. Those properties play out in synergy with the other terpenes and cannabinoids that give each strain its unique chemical profile. Pinene has two molecular forms, alpha-pinene and beta-pinene. The two are identical except for a single molecule. This accounts for their different features and actions. Both work in conjunction with the rest of a cannabis strain's overall chemical profile to support health, and ease the symptoms of a variety of conditions. In nature, alpha-pinene is more prevalent than beta-pinene, and the same is true in cannabis. Alpha-pinene is responsible for the distinctive smell of pine needles and of some herbs, including rosemary. It also accounts for the smell of pine oil and turpentine, and it can also appear in citrus peel. Studies suggest that alpha-pinene might have more potent health benefits than beta-pinene does, but the beta form also plays an important role in protecting the body. Beta pinene contributes to the fragrance of many cooking herbs, including oregano, parsley, and dill. In cannabis, it usually occurs in smaller amounts than the alpha version, but its connections to other terpenes create a synergistic effect. For example, beta pinene appears to play a role in the production of another major terpene, myrcene, and some studies have shown that it can work with the terpene limonene to fight viral infections. Several studies in recent years have revealed that pinene, particularly alpha-pinene, has a number of significant health benefits, including pain relief, antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory features, antiviral characteristics, protection for the geointestinal system, neutralizing THC, and bronchodilation. Pinene is just one component of the many cannabinoids, terpenes, and other substances that make up the whole cannabis plant. It works with all those elements to create an individual strain's unique profile and boost the heating effects of all those other elements as well. Leading the pack of high pinene cannabis strains are Jack Herrer, Dutch Treat, Blue Dream, and Romulan. Pinene is also available as a pure terpene extract that can be used in vaping and dabbing with other forms of cannabis or to add to the foods for flavoring. It's also widely sold as an essential oil for aromatherapy. Just about everybody knows the scent of pinene, even if the name isn't familiar. But pinene is more than just a scent. This abundant cannabis terpene has plenty of heating benefits for both the body and the brain. So our thanks to Hello MD for that wonderful article on the terpene pinene and Gene McKinney, the author of that article. Lots of great information. Check out the link for yourself and find out all the other details about pinene. And now you know why it's an essential ingredient in a lot of sativas. One of the interesting things that I'm finding with doing this podcast is the people that are joining me. The people that are coming by and listening to one, two, maybe all the episodes. And I think the biggest surprise that I have had is members of my family or rather members of my wife's family, that you've actually heard me talk about in a couple of episodes, some of the stories I've related. And I'm very pleased to tell you that both of my sister-in-laws listen fairly regularly to the podcast and are quite enjoying themselves. So welcome, ladies. I won't put your names out there because I know you're not quite ready for that. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for dropping by. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And one of those sister-in-laws 
told me how much he enjoyed the story when I referred to last week about when my in-laws visited us in Winnipeg unexpectedly, and I got caught with a, a bit of cannabis on the kitchen table. So that reminded me, actually, she then reminded me of another story of my mother-in-law, and this is a, this is a fun one, so I'm going to tell that too. This goes back to the early days, well, earlier days, when our children were still fairly young. Of course, we kept the cannabis hidden from them. And I, at that point, had a bong. Ah, yes, remember the bong days. You're probably still using a bong, so you don't have to remember the bong days. That's how I used, or that's what I used back in those days. And I kept my stash, along with the bong, in our living room behind uh, some of the books on a bookcase. Perfectly safe place. It was up too high. The kids couldn't get at it. Nobody had really any reason to go strolling through our bookcase. So I thought it was fine. And then one day my mother-in-law was out for a visit. She'd been with us for a few days. My wife and I went off to work. She was looking after the kids. And I came, came home from work that day. And anybody who's ever had a bong and has had it going for a while, and then you spill it, can relate to the next part of the story. For those of you who have not had a bong and have not let it acquire a significant mm, odiferous quality, shall we say, in the, in the water inside of that bong, well, now I'm hoping you can start to imagine what that might be. And it's okay. It stays when it's in the bong. It doesn't really bother you. It's when it gets out of that bong in a rather unusual way that it causes a problem. So here I am coming home after a long, hard day at work. And I walk into our living room and the very first thing I can smell is the smell of bong water. Clearly that bong is not where it was supposed to be. And it was spilled. <laughs> Without another word... I walked over to the bookcase, which coincidentally had now been rearranged by the size of the books. <laughs> I found my stash and the now empty bong behind some of those books. I picked those up, turned around, and I stormed out of that house. <laughs> I never did speak to my mother-in-law about that, and I don't think my wife ever spoke to her about that either, and I don't think she ever understood exactly what this god-awful smell was and why this stuff was hiding behind <laughs> the books in our bookcase. So there's another interesting memory from years gone by of what life was like before legalization. Now let's turn our attention to the last article I want to talk about this week. And that is from Leafly.com. And I've been a fan of Leafly for years. They've given me lots of information prior to legalization, and they continue to do so. If you haven't discovered it yet, you should. You probably already know about it, though. Leafly has a great article this week that really touches home because we actually experienced this last year, sharing perhaps a little bit more than I should. I found a seed in my bag of cannabis. Can I grow it? That's the point of this article. So you just picked up a new strain that you've been wanting to try. The moment you get home, you rip into the package, take in its smell. And when you dive in deeper, you spot something buried within the bud. It's small, round, and has an outer casing. Congratulations, you found a seed. Or more specifically, a bag seed, as the seeds found in packaged or bagged flour are commonly called. Maybe congratulations aren't quite in order, though. Depending on where it came from, who you ask, and if the seed is viable or not will affect your level of excitement. But finding a seed in your stash is not ideal for truly exceptional flower, and much less common than it once was. Isn't that true? Boy, I used to get seeds in pot all the time. It is still a pretty ordinary occurrence. Anyone who's been smoking cannabis for some time, like myself, has undoubtedly come across a bag seed, and many times seeds, which is what I came across last year. Sometimes you'll notice one when grinding down some flour, or you'll see it pop, spark, and crackle as the heat of the lit bowl pops. Okay, so you found a bag seed. Now what? Well, seeds found in finished cannabis flour can develop for a number of reasons. A nearby male plant can accidentally pollinate a flowering female. More commonly, though, they're a sign of stress, 
and can be attributed to high temperatures during the final stages of flowering or an exaggerated spike in climate or environment. Seeds can also form in plants with genetic disorders or instability, like hermaphrodites, plants that develop both male and female reproductive parts. Now, generally, these conditions are viewed as negatives, and for that reason alone, temper your expectations with any plants you start from a bag seed. If found before lighting it on fire, the first thought from an excited smoker is, let's grow some weed. But before you jump in head first, ask yourself a few questions to help decide if it's worth the time and energy to grow the seed. Was the seed found in good cannabis? Are you ready to grow? Growing cannabis takes a certain level of commitment. Plants need nurturing for months in the right environment with a close eye for detail, and all that takes investment. But fear not, if you're simply curious to learn how cannabis grows and less concerned with the overall outcome, you can plant a couple of bag seeds outside and see what the results are. Is the seed viable? If you like the strain and you're ready to grow, then it comes down to whether or not the seed is viable or able to successfully germinate. For a seed to be viable, it must be mature enough to have a completely formed genetic blueprint, and it must be strong enough to pop through its hard casing and sprout its crucial taproot. Stress on a plant in unstable environments can produce bag seeds, and often a bag seed's viability is questionable at best. There are a few indicators that will give you a sense of whether the seed is worth germinating. Immature seeds tend to be light in color and have a soft outer shell. Visual signs like tiger stripes, dark stripes that resemble tiny roots or veins in a leaf are generally good. A seed with a solid shell will withstand a little pressure when pinched between your fingers. If it crumbles or cracks, the seed will be effectively destroyed, but don't agonize it over your loss. If you think it's viable, then it's time to germinate. That's really the only sure way to find out. Germination is the incubation period that encourages seeds to sprout and develop into a new plant. There are a number of different ways you can germinate cannabis seeds, but they all require the same thing to be successful, water, heat, and air. If you want a complete step-by-step -step guide, check out the link that I have included underneath the podcast episode and get more details on this. And to bring it all back to a personal perspective, last year, we found three seeds. I found three seeds in a sativa strain. We knew this later on. They were viable. All three germinated. All three grew. And how we knew where they were sativas was when we put them in the garden and they grew to nine feet tall. Whew. They just shot up. So that was our experience with three orphan seeds, as I call them, that were found, um, I'm thinking, in something that had a little juicy fruit or, or maybe some pine in it because there was definitely a fruity smell to it. It is possible. And who knows, maybe now this is going to be happening more and more, that seeds are available. We don't have to worry about finding them in our marijuana. We can buy them. And then we can grow our own marijuana. Whether you're growing your own marijuana or you're trying to buy your own marijuana, <laughs> that situation continues to change in the province of British Columbia, of course, where this podcast is centered. We have new stores. We are up to, let me count them now, a whopping two, four, six, seven private retail stores across our province. <laughs> the latest to join the retail fray is the Higher Path, which is in Trail. Vancouver now has two city cannabis stores. And, of course, the remaining two in Kimberley that started us all, and Pouscoupe, or Pouscoupe, as people are wont to call it, seven stores now. And there was a rumor that I heard OkanaganZ.com talk about that the second BC cannabis store, the second government liquor store, or <laughs> the second government cannabis store, is purported to be heading to Prince George. They've got Kamloops. Now the second one looks like it's heading to Prince George. We'll keep our eye on that one as well. The landscape continues to change as we are three months into legalization in our country. And that is about all I got for you for episode number eight. Next week, got something interesting lined up. I sat down with my friend David Wiley once more from OkanaganZ.com, and he turned the tables on me. He did an interview on me to get a bit of perspective on where I've been and where this podcast started from. And if it works out, in other words, if I like the way it sounds, next week I will probably play a bit of that interview so you get a sense of where I am at. 
And also, David and I had some further discussion on the state of Canadian legalization, where we're at, some things that we think should possibly be changed. So we'll probably drop a little bit of that on for you next week. As always, if you have anything you'd like to share with me, like Stephen did today on the temperature of terpenes, please send it along to info at cannabispodcast.com. You can contact me anytime on Twitter at Cannabis Podcast, anytime on Facebook at Weed Podcast. If you have any suggestions for people you would like to hear, let me know. We'll see if we can line up some interviews and, and talk about the people that you would like to hear some of those questions answered for. I'm kind of giving up on whether or not Daniel Larson is ever going to show up. Uh, I have connected with him a few times, but he is just so hard to nail everything down. So I'm kind of putting that one off onto the wayside. So if you have somebody else that you would like me to talk to, please let me know. I really do appreciate you being here. It means a lot to me. I'm enjoying myself and I'm glad you're along for the ride. That is it for episode eight of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.